There's a time to reap, a time to sow. Got a hearty hankering for Gwent. This could hurt. None shall tread on us. to help one or the other. Hooch left. I'm a monster. Strength, my love. Sod it. 
It's not at all. Tired my tongue about yeah. that. that they were easily manipulated. As soon as the battle had come to an end, the prisoners were brought before the Queen. All, without exception, were dwarves, and all looked to be youthful dwarves. Mystery solved, muttered Meave. In fact, these were the missing Drekthaggers. Instead of returning home, they had enlisted with guerrillas fighting for non-human rights. But what had prompted so drastic a decision? I was impatient. Wanted badly to turn 50. I couldn't wait to see human cities. Vitsima, Tretigor, Novigrad. Said one of the dwarven prisoners while pressing a bandage to a bleeding wound. And you know the welcome that awaited me there? I was spit upon and called names. I saw ghettos, massacres. And how was I to go back to the mines after that? We must fight while we still can. Before the humans come to cut us down, we must tell the rest of ours the same. Pull all Maha come into the fight! Neve's soldiers stood waiting for her to protest, to accuse the dwarf of lying. But the queen could not pretend she did not understand why the dwarf had taken up arms. Without entering into a discussion, she ordered the prisoners taken to be tried and judged by their kin and elders. Along her way, Meave heard cries. She rushed to see what the ruckus was about. Upon seeing Black Rayler spattered with blood, she expected the worst. Reynard could only confirm the Queen's fears. She entered the wagon unnoticed, the wagon carrying the prisoners. She then cut their throats, one by one. Forty dwarves. Alone. They were shackled. They could not defend themselves. Rayla had nothing to say in her defense. In point of fact, she exuded pride. Mahakam had been free of Scoyatel, till now. We'd have done all a questionable favor by bringing back a wagon full of enraged youth, wearing squirrel tails. They'd have posed as martyrs for a just cause. They'd have shown off their scars and persuaded the clans to make war on humans. All that deserved to be nipped in the bud. Meave could see the blood rushing to Reynard's head. When he finally spoke, it was clear he was holding the reins of his emotions, preventing himself from exploding with some difficulty. Your Grace, we must banish her, drive her off. This was in no way ordinary insubordination. This was a grave crime. Your Majesty. You know, I rarely meddle in your affairs, said Isbel. Yet for this, I cannot remain silent. This woman must go. I neither accept nor condone what Rayla did. Yet, there is a war on. And she is one of the best warriors I have under my command, said the Queen. Naturally, I shall punish her. But I cannot banish her. Reynard opened his mouth to say something, but upon spotting Rayla's scornful smile, he turned on his heel and marched off without a word. He was later seen in the mess tent, drinking alone, his eyes fixed on the bottom of his tankard. The Lyrians remained silent throughout their return. Upon spying their downcast eyes and somber means, the dwarves awaiting the return of their offspring dispersed to their homes, leaving baskets full of treats in the snow. No one asked any questions of Meave. Luckily so, as the Queen would not have known how to answer.
Mom, I've come to tell you I must leave your army. What? Why? Against my better judgment, I joined you to heal your wounded. I realize now that was a mistake. What exactly do you mean? What you did runs counter to all my beliefs. You had your reasons, and have them still, I know. Yet I've no desire to abet them. I'd feel shame to lend a hand. What can I do? Is there anything that would make you stay? No, ma'am. Farewell. So be it. Good luck and Godspeed, Isabel. Didn't he find nothing? Not a trace. What could have happened? Didn't he find nothing? Queen noted a building with unusually lavish ornamentation, including shining bronze roof tiles and glistening rock crystal window panes. An important clan dwelled there, Gabor explained. The Brecon Riggs. Could you introduce me? Meave asked. Perhaps I can convince them to intercede with Bruver on my behalf. The clan head, Ivor, invited Meave to an exquisite feast. But when she broached the subject of the war raging just outside Mahakam's borders, the dwarf changed the subject at once. Looking around the interior, Meave quickly understood why. The walls were ordained with Nilfgaardian tapestries and rugs. Gifts from friendly Imperial envoys, no doubt. Meave prepared to leave, convinced she had wasted her time, when someone clasped her shoulder and pulled her into a darkened room. Her kidnapper turned out to be a young dwarf. Female, it seemed, dressed in her nightshirt. She introduced herself as Ivor's daughter, Eudora Breckenriggs, and openly admitted she had eavesdropped on Meave's dinner conversation. Listen, me dad's stubborner than an old goat, but I'll convince him to help you for a wee favour, that is. Mm-hmm. What? I want you to steal something from the clan archive. Historiae Mahakamorum, tis called. See, me da won't let me betroth me sweetikin Zoltan. Says the Codex forbids marrying a dwarf who's left the mountains. But there's precedent. Just such a case described in that document. If I can show it to Da, he'll have to change his mind. Me felt sympathy for Eudora and wanted to help her, especially considering the favor Eudora could do her in return. But she fully realized if her attempt to break into the archive ended badly, it would result in a tremendous scandal Bruva Hoog would not soon forget. Listen, I wish all the best for you and Zeltan. Uh, Zoltan. Eudora corrected. Yes, right. Zoltan. In any case, it's too risky. I've much to gain from the support of your clan, but if the mission ended in failure, I'd lose even more. Eudora shrugged and returned to her bedroom. Meave resumed her interrupted journey wondering if the dwarf would find some other way to betroth her beloved Zoltan.
Bonnie Holmes, eh? Just slightly different from those straw-covered kludges of yours. <laughs> You're no cold without a beard. What are you poking me for? Ah, scrounging for coin, no doubt. Righty then, take this pouch and kindly get off my arse.
I get that darn dope. I told you to hold your horses or you'll shake the hitch loose. Oh, now you're a bleeding expert, are you? You overloaded the damn cart, that's why it's busted. A wagon lay strewn across the middle of the road. Behind it stood others, some loaded with gold, jewels and other valuables, others groaning under barrels of pickled meat. Each dwarf had his own theory about how the accident had come about and thundered it out to all and sundry, peppered with choice invectives. An odd caravan, Meave said. They don't look like merchants. Nay, they ain't, Gabor answered. Dwarves of the Ferenc clan, carrying gifts for the Drake. Remember Keltilus? When he took roost here, Ferences fought him for near a century. Then the dragon got weary of fighting and they realized he weren't going nowhere, so they cut a deal. He didn't bother them. They give him what he needs. Well, well. And these offerings they send often? Every week. Excuse me, got to separate them lads, before they tear out each other's beards. Hey there! Cool your idiot heads! Gabor managed to douse his brethren's fiery tempers. But the wagon still lay across the road, blocking all traffic. Queen, said Xavier, it is an easy repair. I have the tools, the parts. Need but your permission. Of course. Go see what can be done. Xavier did indeed make quick work of the problem. Within moments, the wagon was rolling smoothly down the road, good as new. Well, shaft me, your highness, said one of the dwarves. Your engineer's got a paint like stewed meat, but he kens his trade. That's for certain. I'll convey your words to him. Or at least part of them. Uh, me and the lads will be on our way now, but, but first, take this. Bit of gold by way of thanks. Thank you, Meave said, accepting the surprisingly heavy pouch. In wartime, every copper counts. The dwarf bowed in parting, shook the snow off his beard, then rejoined his caravan. Within a few moments, the wagons had disappeared around the bend. A pillar of smoke rose above the mountains, and a sooty aroma filled the air. Fire, Gabor said, then took a deep sniff. Perhaps a bolt struck some barren trees. No, Meave said curtly. I know that scent too well. All Edurn reeked of it. It's the smell of burning homes. The Lyrians quickened their gait. Soon they saw a town fully aflame, and a roaring, furious dragon above it. That's... Your Keltonus? Gascon asked, shielding his eyes from the sharp glare emanating from the city. You were right. Perfectly harmless. Then the king was get his knickers in a bunch, the dwarf said, grabbing his axe from his belt. Queen, 
We gotta make haste to the rescue. Reynard! Meave called out. Have our men wet their cloaks for a modicum of fire protection. We move as soon as they're done. Your Grace, they are but common soldiers. To fight a dragon. I know. But we must help them, or at least try. While Reynard went to pass on the order, Meave turned to Gabble. This dragon. Has it any weakness? Fear not, said the somber dwarf. Except a fondness for raw meat. Meade nodded and swallowed dryly. Despite the cold, she felt sweat pour down her skull. Stifling her fear, Meave gave the order to attack, and her soldiers rode into the flaming city. From up close, Keltalis looked even more terrified. Though enormous, he moved with shocking agility, like a lizard scurrying over sand. With one swing of his paw, he snapped the necks of three dwarves, then bisected a fourth with a powerful bite. After that, he turned his attention to the Lyrians. Lord of you! He said, twisting his bloody moor into a horrifying smile. God! me stay together you'll never take me alive We're taking losses! She's on! Again and again and again.
Nice cars. No, they don't hurt. Time to sow. Discipline shall bring us victory! Ah! Abolist in your command. Armor won't say. 